I'm gonna try to beat a Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Ghost types. And that can be pretty tricky, since the Nuzlocke rules that I'll be following state that any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, no items from the bag option are allowed in battle, I must play on set mode, I'm not allowed to level past the next gym leader, and I can of course only capture Ghost type Pokemon and only the first one I find in any given area. Now there are a lot of Dark type trainers to deal with in this run, which could make it pretty tough for my Ghosts, however, I will get a chance to use one of my favorites, Dragapult. So let me know what your favorite ghost type is down below and let's get started. Listen, I'm a huge fan of barbecue, but in the Pokemon world, what exactly are we grilling? And why does poor Wulu have to watch? Anyway, our adventure begins in the wild area where I've decided that I can only catch one Pokemon per gym badge. I did this so I wouldn't just get a full team of six right as I got to the wild area. With that in mind, the first Pokemon I encounter is the first ghost Pokemon ever introduced, Ghastly, which I name Onion. Now, if any of you guys managed to guess the naming theme for this video down in the comments, I'll be very impressed. And while Onion has a special attack boosting nature, the minus speed nature was almost enough for me to reset the entire run. However, we were actually more likely to get Duskull at the Watchtower Ruins, so I'll take what I can get. The first Dark type related trainers I have to face are Team Yell over in Motostoke. And even though these guys have exclusively Dark types on their team, it's so early game that most of them don't even have a Dark move in their moveset. On top of that, acquiring the Dazzling Gleam TR in the wild area makes them easy pickings. Moving on to Route 4, we can find our first non-wild area ghost type, which happens to be Pumpkaboo. And while this little guy is one of the cutest Pokemon ever made that I happen to name Monaco, its dex entry kind of suggests otherwise. When taking spirits to the afterlife, small Pumpkaboo prefer the spirits of children to those of adults. Excuse me, what? So unless we want to reenact a more pumpkin-centric version of Death Note, this thing's gonna be pretty useless since it can't even evolve. So as we take on Milo, despite only having two Pokemon, Ghastly is kind of the perfect counter. You see, both Milo's Eldegoss and his Gossifleur, which incidentally just gets one shot by a sludge bomb, only have normal and grass type moves. Obviously, the normal type moves don't even affect Ghost, and since Ghastly doubles up as a poison type, we can resist the grass type moves. So after hitting the Dynamax Eldegoss, the Goss with a Sludge Bomb, which does more than half and gets the poison, I can tank a max overgrowth at above half HP and just follow that up with another Sludge Bomb, getting us the first gym badge. This means we're eligible for another encounter in the wild area, and I aim to try and catch a Ninkata. Or maybe it's pronounced Ninkata, since it's a Cicada. Either way, Ninky Dink here isn't a ghost type, and it doesn't even evolve into a ghost type. However, with some space in our party and a spare Pokeball in our bag, as we evolve into Ninkata, we actually get Shedinja. And even with the ability to dodge any non-super effective move, this guy's not that good. Moving on to Route 5, we have a fitting 5% chance to encounter a wild Drifloon. And while I just want to give this little guy a hug, perhaps seeking company, it approaches children. Why do ghost types have to creep on kids? Like, what the funny enough I said that Shedinja was not that great, unless you're in a scenario like this where we have to face Hop before getting to Holbury. Two of his three Pokemon don't have moves that can hit Shedinja, so any fight like this that comes up is pretty much a free win. This sounds incredibly broken, but the game developers actually did a really good job balancing the game to make that not exactly possible. Let's talk about Nessa for a second. She's got a Goldeen that can only hit us with Water Pulse and Whirlpool. Not really a threat, and great for potential setup. Her Aracuda has Bite, just like Dreadnaw, which rules out any possible Shedinja strats. Then there's Dreadnaw, which we can normally outspeed with Ghastly at base, but since Dreadnaw has a base speed of 74 and my Ghastly has a minus speed nature, effectively making its base 80, minus 10%, a 72. Therefore, I needed some EVs to make my strategy even remotely viable. So I headed off to the wild area to exterminate some bunnelbees for as many speed EVs as possible, and this took a long time. But the one who is patient often spends their life waiting for a lot of stuff, but in this case, it definitely paid off. You see, to beat Dreadnought, we're gonna need some pretty specific setup. The Goldeen keeps wanting to hit me with Water Pulse since it's the most powerful move it can hit me with, but since I'm setting up Calm Minds, I keep getting special attack boosts along along with special defense boosts that make the Water Pulse do less damage every single turn. The Calm Mines, along with the Leftovers, made it very easy to just set up to plus six against this thing, and I didn't even get confused in the process. However, the Goldeen did go for a couple of agilities, which means that it's going to outspeed Ghastly after we switch into it with Baton Pass. This means it's gonna hit Ghastly before we get to take it out with Energy Ball, which could confuse it, and of course that's exactly what happens. This could kill the entire run, leaving it up to chance, but I came prepared for this exact exact scenario, going for Hypnosis, which I happen to miss. The miss here is actually not that bad, since it 
just lets us try and go for Hypnosis the next turn, which I do connect with through the confusion and bad accuracy. The turn afterwards, the Goldeen stays asleep and I stay confused, hitting myself in confusion. After that, the Goldeen stays asleep again as I snap out of confusion, going for Hypnosis again. Once I've snapped out of confusion, it's safe to just go for the Energy Ball, taking out the Goldeen, which is going to send in Aerocuda. And since Aerocuda is slower than Dreadnought base, which we prepared for with the EVs, we can take it out with an Energy Ball, which leaves us with only Dynamax Dreadnought, but since we outspeed and we've got an Expert Belt quad effective Energy Ball, it is going to grant us the second badge. And beating Nessa, Onion got to level 25, meaning that it evolves into a Haunter. Now, a lot of people prefer Haunter to Gengar, and I used to always be a Gengar type of guy, but after reading Haunter's dex entry, which is pretty metal, I might have changed my mind. Its tongue is made of gas. If licked, its victim starts shaking constantly until death eventually comes. Beware the lick of death. Moving on, the next gym leader we have to face is Kabu, who has historically given me a lot of trouble throughout these runs. And as I was doing my preparations for this fight, I was sitting in a call with my good friend Andrew, who casually just mentioned that Kabu's completely walled by skill swap. Thinking that this was going to be a foolproof strategy, Kabu took the opportunity to make me look like a fool. But before I reveal what misfortune led to that disaster, we do actually have a Pokemon we can catch in the gym. This might be the only time we ever get to catch a Pokemon in a gym in a Pokemon game, but we can actually find a Litwick, which is promptly added to the team. I name it Sinner, and unfortunately it's got Flame Body instead of Flash Fire, which could have really helped us out here. Going into the fight versus Kabu, I was feeling very confident, and as you know, the greater the pride, the greater the fall. However, at this point in the fight, I felt unbeatable, getting hit by a Will-O-Wisp from this Ninetale, which burns me, which I then promptly heal off with a Rostberry, I can go for the Skill Swap, which gets me the Flash Fire ability. Because Ninetales only has Fire and Normal type moves, at this point it can't hit me with anything, so I'm free to set up as much as I want, getting to plus 6 with Calm Mind. I also set up my defense to plus 3 with Stockpile, since I am still going to be slower than Arcanine. Then once at plus 6 Special Attack and Special Defense and plus 3 Defense, I can take out the Ninetales with a Shadow Ball, sending in Arcanine. Much like Ninetales, this Arcanine only has Fire and Normal type moves, except for the addition of Bite, which doesn't do that much damage, but it manages to get a flinch. The next turn, it of course goes for Bite again, and gets another flinch. Another Bite takes me down to a mere 14 HP, after which I very fortunately don't flinch and I can take out the Arcanine with a Shadow Ball. I was still pretty optimistic. I've got plus 3 defense and I quad resist its bug type moves. Heck, I was even pretty sure that I was going to outspeed this thing, which I do, hitting it with a Shadow Ball for what looks like well over half HP. I then get hit to 2 HP from Max Flutterby, which I miraculously survive, but it does lower my special attack. At this point, all I could do was pray that a Shadow Ball would take it out, and it leaves it at what must must be one singular HP, as it then just goes for Max Flutterby, taking out Drifloon, getting us our first death of the run. Funny enough, this gives Monaco the spotlight, taking out the Scorch with a Shadow Sneak, which does give us the third gym badge, but at a steep cost. Losing Drifloon this early in the run is a huge deal. I'm not going to pretend that I'll miss the trouble he's caused. However, losing my premier baton passer of the run does make me feel a bit less safe. Speaking of which, if you would like to feel safe all the time while browsing the web, you should check out this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. A VPN is a great way to keep your online identity safe as you're browsing by encrypting the data sent between your device and the internet. And aside from keeping your personal information out of the hands of big companies and cyber criminals, it's also a great way to bypass region-based censorships on your favorite streaming sites. Like the other day I was going to watch Spider-Man just to find out it's not available to me in Sweden. However, with the power of a VPN like Surfshark, I could change my location to the UK with a click of a button and movie night was saved. Jolly good there, chaps. This could let you watch all-time great shows like Friends, The Office, and more that aren't available in your region. So to get your own account and stay safe out there, and to help out me and this channel, use my code surfshark.com deals forward slash antler or just the first link in the description to get 83% off your purchase and an extra three months for free. There's also a 30 day money back guarantee to make sure you're satisfied with the service. So check out that link and let's get back to gaming. With another badge, it's time for another encounter in the wild area, and this time I go and find a snow runt which happens to be female. I name her Rapunzel, and after picking up the Dawnstone in the wild area, we can immediately 
evolve her into a frost lass. You guys ever think about how Rose goes through all this trouble to stay incognito, to not be spotted in public, yet he forgets to put on pants? Either way, we can head to Route 6, where we can find our next encounter, a Galarian Yamask, which I named Carrot. I then head to the Hammerlock Hills, where in a snowstorm I can find myself a Hone Edge, which I named Gemini. This is great, since behind the Pokemon Center and Stoan side, we can find ourselves a Dusk Stone, so after evolving into a Dublade, I can immediately turn it into an Aegislash. And with that, we can not only challenge B, we can utterly annihilate her and her reputation since she uses fighting types. Because her Hitmontop only has quick attack and fighting moves, it can't hit Aegislash at all since Ghost resists both fighting and normal, which means we can set up to both plus six attack and plus six speed with Swords Dance and Autotomize. Once that's done, all we have to do is press Aerial Ace, one-shotting every single one of B's fighting type Pokemon, easy peasy. I have to win this for the chairman. Oh, you just a little nasty. Heading on towards Balan Lea, we move through Glimwood Tangle, where we can either find a Phantump or a Sinistee, which is what I happen to run into. Backtracking to pick up the Cracked Pot, we can immediately evolve Okie Dokie into a Poltegeist. Now look, we do have to take on Opal next, but her fight is barely worth mentioning. Since Weezing only has a not very effective Fairy Wind to hit Aegislash with, since it's immune to both Tackle and Sludge, we can incredibly freely just set up to plus six attack and speed again using Swords Dance and Autotomize, and on top of that, the questions that Opal asks just serve as a bonus. Once that's done, a single stab super effective plus six Iron Head is of course enough to take out every single one of her Pokemon. Honestly, Opal's Gym is pretty much a joke unless you're using a type that's weak to Fairy, in which case, it can be a bit tricky. However, let me tell you about something that doesn't give me trouble in most runs that was incredibly difficult this time, and that was Hop. You see, for this one specific fight, Hop has an incredibly fast Boltund that of course knows Crunch. On top of that, it's not just a free setup opportunity for Aegislash against his lead, since his Trevenant has Confuse Ray. And so for this fight, I had to get a bit creative, starting off by taking out the Trevenant with a Shadow Ball in one shot. And this will not only impress the simple mind of Hop, but also bait out the Boltund. And my best strategy to be able to beat this thing was luck, 70% of luck specifically, because after surviving on one HP with a Focus Sash, I go ahead and use Hypnosis, which I thankfully connect with putting the Boltund to sleep. The next turn, I go for a Sludge Bomb, figuring I can probably take it out in one hit, but of course it leaves it with like one HP, which means that I have to risk it waking up the next turn, but it very fortunately doesn't, so we can take it out. Next up is Inteleon, which could easily go for any of its moves since all of them see the kill. So I go ahead and swap into Monaco just in case it goes for Snipe Shot, but I realize right here that it's probably just wiser to swap into Shedinja since the only move that can hit it is Sucker Punch, which is very easy to play around. This did, however, take some time because while I could dodge all the Sucker Punches by going for Harden, it then just kept using Tearful Look to lower my attack. So it's safe to say that stalling this thing out with Shedinja took absolutely forever, but in the end, we got it done. This is gonna bait the Heat more, which could hit us with either a Fire Lash or a Lick, so I have to swap out here and I go into Gemini, who unfortunately gets hit by a Fire Lash, which I didn't even know lowers defense. Having leftovers here is gonna increase our survivability and the fact that King Shield is such a broken move since it protects us and then lowers the Heat more's attack. To get rid of the defense drop, I now have to swap, so I go into Okie Doki, who's our only team member who's not weak to fire, but I kind of forgot it's got weak armor, which is gonna lower its defense twice. For this reason, I once again swap out into Gemini, who's gonna tank another hit, which means I can then go for another King Shield, lowering the Heatmore's attack once again. But even though we're getting this Heatmore's attack down, we are kind of getting low on health on both Gemini and Okie Doki. As my Poltegeist gets swapped in again and lowered to minus two defense with weak armor, I realize I'm probably gonna have to let it go, so I just decide to stay in, and a Psy Shock does ever so slightly over half as I get hit by another Fire Lash, which I somehow managed to survive on 10 and HP. This means I don't actually have to sack Okie Dokie, because another Sashok is enough to take out the Heatmore, which means we only have to deal with Snorlax. And this is pretty easily done, since Shedinja can dodge all its attacks with Wonder Guard. Denied. Overall, probably the most difficult hop fight I've had to deal with, but I'm impressed we got through it with no deaths. The next actual gym fight we have to face is against Gordy and his rock types. And I remember saying earlier that Pumpkaboo was gonna be useless, but it's already proved itself versus Kabu. And with the Eviolite item and resisting everything on this Barbarical's moveset, I'm pretty confident I can just take it out with a Seed Bomb, which is especially true after it goes for Shell Smash, lowering its defenses. Next is Shuckle, which is really annoying to deal with, but inflicting it with Burn and Leech Seed is at least 
it's going to chip away at its health every single turn. Since it only has resisted moves and a pitiful attack stat, I can just stall it out and eventually it goes down which sends in Stonejourner. It immediately sets up Wonder Room, swapping our defenses as I take the chance to go for Will-O-Wisp, burning it since it only has Rock-type moves. I'm honestly not very concerned with the damage output from this thing in the first place, but you can never be too sure and it's always best to go the safe route in a Nuzlocke. On the switch to Gemini, the Stonejourner goes for a Stealth Rock, which is fine since I don't intend on doing any switching. This will let me get to plus six with Swords Dance, however, because the Rock Tombs are lowering my speed, I do have to set up with Autonomize just to get back to neutral speed. Once that was done, all we have to do is click Sacred Swords, taking out the Stonejourner and even the Colossal in one hit, granting us the sixth gym badge. Now, there is another hop fight right after this, but for whatever reason, he ditches his Strongjaw bolt end here, so it's not really a big deal this time around. Reaching Route 9, we can finally get ourselves another encounter, and a great one at that, a Jellicent. I name him Skeleton and start making my way towards Spikemouth, and that of course means that we have to take on Piers the Dark-type Master. For many reasons, this fight was gonna be tricky, but Scrafty was definitely not one of them, since I could just easily take it out with a quad effect of Dazzling Gleam from Onion. When thinking about how to deal with Malamar, at first, First, I wanted to use Aegislash to lower its attack until I realized that it has Contrary, which wouldn't do me much good. After burning it and getting hit by a Night Slash, I swap out of Onion into Skeleton. And I get very lucky on the switch as it goes for a Psycho Cut, which would have been super effective against Onion's Poison type. And right here, we've gotten to that special point of the run where my most optimal strategy was Stall. I realized that even if this Malamar got a critical hit, I'd be able to recover most of it back. All I had to do now was use Recover until the burn damage left it in a range where I figured I could take it out with a single Scald. However, I kind of pulled the plug prematurely here since the Scald leaves it in the red and it's not even enough to take it out with the burn. I then just instinctively figure that Pierce is going to go for a Hyper Potion here, but he ends up going for Night Slash, which means I waste a turn Will-O-Wisping, but at least he goes down to the burn. This puts me in a pretty awkward spot versus this Obstagoon, since I really can't switch anything in against it, I decide to just sack Onion. Not being able to evolve and the fact that we have a bunch of other better teammates members at this point, I figure it's probably my best sacrifice. I then send in Aegislash and make sure to use King's Shield against the Throat Chop, lowering the Obstagoon's attack. It then goes for Obstruct, which is perfect as I can set up an Iron Defense to increase my survivability a bit. This means the incoming Throat Chop barely does any damage, and since I know it's not going to go for Obstruct this turn, I can freely go for Sacred Sword, which is quad super effective, taking it out in one hit. This only leaves Skuntank, but because of our boosted defense, I'm not really worried about what it can do, so I just take it out with a couple of Sacred Swords, granting us the seventh gym badge. The story then takes us back to Hammerlock for our final gym challenge, and this gym being a double battle can be incredibly difficult. So to prepare myself for my final gym fight, I head over to the Lake of Outrage to pick up a Focus Sash. The main point of this expedition, however, is picking up a second Dusk Stone, which means that we can evolve Litwick first into Lampent. This Pokemon appears just before someone passes away, so it's feared as an emissary of death. I mean, fine, he's still super cute. Unfortunately, Sinner's not gonna stay a Lampent for long because that Dust Stone lets us evolve it into a Chandelure. And with that, it's time to take on the final gym leader, Raihan, and his weather types. He leads with Flygon and Gigalith, which is gonna set up Sandstorm, which pretty much nullifies any strategy using Focus Sash. I did, however, give Rapunzel the Choice Scarf to guarantee outspeed this Flygon, taking it out with a quad effective Ice Beam. I then outspeed the Gigalith with Skeleton, going for a Will-O-Wisp to lower its attack as it just sets up Stealth Rocks. In comes Sandicon which I outspeed with an Ice Beam, but it doesn't quite do enough to take it out, which means that I do get glared, lowering Rapunzel's speed. I then use Acid Armor with Skeleton to increase its defense as the Gigalith goes for a Rock Blast, surprisingly on Skeleton. Another Ice Beam does not leave me paralyzed, which means I can take out the Sandaconda. Then because of the Sandstorm boosting Gigalith's special defense, the Scald doesn't quite do enough to take it out as Gigalith hits Rapunzel with a Rock Blast, thankfully only twice. As Duraludon comes in, Frostlass really can't do do that much in this matchup, so I swap out into Gemini, expecting the Duraludon to hit it with a max Rockfall. This is then exactly what happens, and because Gemini resists it with its massive base 150 defense, it barely takes any damage and I can burn the Duraludon, then getting hit by a Rock Blast. Following turn, I take the chance to go for both King Shield and Protect, mostly just to waste the next Dynamax turn. I therefore barely take any damage from the G-Max Depletion and can protect myself from the Rock Blast. There's now only one more turn of Gigantamax left, and the max Rockfall barely 
does any damage because of that defense boost from Acid Armor. I spend the final Gigantamax turn going for an Iron Defense on Gemini and Acid Armor with Skeleton to boost my defense on both Pokemon since both of my foes are physical attackers. The Gigalith slightly bypasses this by going for Sand Tomb, but since its special attack is so poor, it really doesn't do much at all. At this stage, I'm completely free to just take out the rest of Raihan's team, and this might be the easiest time I've actually had beating this guy, which is pretty crazy. Defeating the gym means that we can come back to the Lake of Outrage for some unfinished business. Since we're now allowed to catch Pokemon up to level 55, I can go and find myself a Dreepy. I name her Zim, and she really won't be that useful until she evolves. This means we can now progress to Winden, which means it's time for the next Dark-type challenge. And Marnie's actually particularly difficult. The trick here is we have to play around two Pokemon with Swagger, and that can be kind of tough since we can only equip Aegislash with one Lumberry. Either way, the first turn we get hit by Torment from Lipard as I go for a Sword Stance boosting my attack. I was honestly kind of hoping it would go for Snarl here since that would make my strategy work a lot better, but this does work out too since I can freely take out the Lipard with an Iron Head. The Iron Head is very important here since because we set up that Sword Stance, we can one-shot the Scrafty with a Sacred Sword, which is one of the Swagger Pokemon dealt with. Then since we're in Attack Stance, the Toxic Croak sees the kill with a Sucker Punch, which means I can go for a King Shield here, dodging it. I then hope and pray that the Toxicroak goes for Swagger, which it does absolutely perfectly, meaning we can heal off the Confusion with a Lumberry and then just hit it with an Iron Head for the KO. This, in fact, eliminates all danger from the rest of this fight, and because we're at plus four attack, we can easily just take out the rest of Marnie's team, which is the final Dark-type challenge completed. Next up is Hop, but between Shedinja and Aegislash, this fight was so easy that I'm not even gonna include it. Ugh, have you guys seen the chairman's pants? Going insane after a week of searching for Rosa's trousers, we have to take on Oleana. And her Frostlass can be a pain in the rear, so what I did is I equipped Sinner with a Choice Scarf, which means that we can instantly take it out with a Flamethrower. Next up is Milotic, and facing this thing was the biggest pain I've had to deal with all year. It starts out by setting up an Aqua Ring as I send in Skeleton. And while Skeleton has Water Absorb to dodge the only attacking move that this Milotic has, I realized very quickly that I didn't teach it Energy Ball before the fight, which means I kinda had to improvise. Unfortunately, we can't status this Milotic because it keeps using safeguards, so my best bet was using Metal Claw, which did just a bit more damage than it healed up with Aqua Ring, which means I could start stalling out its recovers. And this was a huge pain. To put my pain into perspective, in middle school, I once stubbed my pinky toe so hard that it turned entirely blue and stayed that way for like a month. And fighting this Milotic was still worse than that. Eventually though, the Milotic did run out of recovers, at which point I realized that maybe I can put Monaco to use here since it can only be hit by Surf. Now, I obviously can't hit this thing with a Will-O-Wisp since it's still protected by Safeguard. However, Leech Seed is not considered a conventional status condition. For that reason, I can actually start doing some reliable damage to this thing, stalling out further with Protect. I also figured I might as well try my hand at a Seed Bomb here, and Monaco actually ends up doing like half of this Milotic's health, which is insane. And even though I could take this Milotic out with another Seed bomb, the whole reason I wanted to stall it out of recovers is because I wanted to set up against this thing to prepare for her next Pokemon. So I swap back into Skeleton and make sure to set up to plus six defense with Acid Armor before taking out the Milotic with a combination of Scalds and Leech Seed. Finally, having dealt with that infernal eel, Oleana's next Pokemon is Serena, which does have a super effective move against us in Tropkick, but because of our plus six defense, we can easily tank it and go for Will-O-Wisp to get that residual damage, since my only attacking move is unfortunately Scald. The Serena then hits me with an Attract, which, yeah, I mean, is just gonna delay the inevitable, really. After dealing with some war flashbacks from fighting Whitney as a kid, I do finally manage to get off a few recovers and enough damage to take out the Serena. This means Oleana has two Pokemon Pokemon left, the first of which she'll send in is Salazzle. Predicting this Salazzle to go for a poison gas, even in my planning, I did give Skeleton a Petcha Berry. However, unfortunately, I'm not able to do enough damage to take out the Salazzle in one hit. This unfortunately means that it's gonna get off a second poison gas, poisoning us before we can take it out with a Scald, which only leaves her final Pokemon, Garboder. One very important thing to note about poison gas is that it's normal poison and not toxic poison, which doesn't increase exponentially every single turn 
turn. So as the Garboder wastes its first Dynamax turn going for a Max Quake, which we can tank easily with our plus six defense, I go for Recover to get back to full health. The second turn of Dynamax, it then insists on going for another Max Quake as I retaliate with a Scald just to try and fish for the burn, and in hindsight, I should have just gone for Will-O-Wisp here since that would have guaranteed the burn 70% of the time. Either way, the final turn of Dynamax, it does set up to plus three special defense with another Max Quake as I can go for a Recover, which means that it's gonna turn back to its normal form. I expect since it sees that it can't really do that much damage, it starts to lay up the Toxic Spikes as I go for a Will-O-Wisp, and after a whole lot of turns and me having to go for Recover a lot because of that poison damage, I finally take out the Garboder with a combination of Scald and Burn damage. And because of stalling out that Milotic, this is probably the single longest fight I've ever had to do in Pokemon, and thinking about it honestly makes my toe hurt. Everything I did, I did to further the chairman's own goals. Yeah, but I mean, couldn't you have just like bought him a new pair of pants? Gym Leader Bead. Not exactly a fitting title for someone who gets swept by an Aegislash. Or maybe it is fitting since it's exactly what happened to your predecessor, Opal. Regardless, the real fight we have to prepare for is the rematch versus Nessa. She starts out with Golisopod as I send in my choice scarfed Frostlass. The reason that it's scarfed is definitely not this Golisopod, which I can easily outspeed, take down below health with a Thunderbolt, sending in the Barrascuda. This thing has an incredibly fast base 136 base speed, which I can only outspeed with a choice scarf, but since its defenses are so poor, I can easily just take it out with a Thunderbolt. Nessa then sends back in her Golisopod, which gets dealt with by a Thunderbolt as well. Her next Pokemon is Seeking, but since it doesn't have any moves to hit Shedinja super effectively, I can freely just swap it in and take it out with a few X scissors. Second to last is Pelipper, which sets up the rain with its Drizzle ability, and since it can just take us out with an Air Slash, I do have to swap out here, going into Skeleton. And since Jellicent's special defense is absolutely amazing, the Air Slash doesn't do too much at about 20%, as I can start hitting the Pelipper with Scalds. However, as I go for a second Scald the next turn, the Pelipper throws a wrench in my plan by going for Tailwind. This means that for the next few turns, Nessa's team is gonna have boosted speed, so I decide to stay in with Skeleton just to waste one of these turns, going for Recover, boosting up my health. And here, I was really hoping for a two-turn Tailwind, swapping in Sinner here as the Pelipper goes for a Roost, recovering its HP. Unfortunately for me, the Tailwind does not end here, but the Rain does. This does mean that the Pelipper will outspeed me the next turn, but no Rain means it's not boosted, which means I can take it out with an Energy Ball. The Tailwind then perfectly peters out as she sends in her Dredna, which as we know has a base speed of 76. This means that my Chandelure with a base speed of 80 and not a minus speed nature like Ghastly can certainly outspeed the Dreadnought, taking it out in one hit with a Choice Specs quad effective energy ball. I was definitely afraid of the super fast, super strong Barrascuda with Throat Chop, but using the choice items to my advantage here really came in clutch. Having defeated Nessa, we have two more Gym Leader rematches ahead of us, so I decide to evolve Zim into a Dracloak. And here's the thing about B. If she was easy the last time we faced her, it's even easier now since I decided to only bring Dracloak on my team. That's how confident I was. You see, this Halucha cannot hit us with its two fighting type moves, and as it goes for bounce, I can freely just set up a Dragon Dance, going for Protect the next turn since it very heavily telegraphs when it's gonna hit us. For this reason, it was incredibly easy for Zim to set up to plus six attack and plus six speed with what's possibly the most broken setup move in all of Pokemon. From there, since Zim wasn't holding an item, a plus six acrobatics was enough to take out every single Pokemon on B's team. This leaves us with our final gym leader rematch versus Raihan. He leads with Torkoal and I send in Choice Specs Sinner, who can immediately outspeed and take out the Torkoal in one hit with a Stab Shadow Ball. He next sends in Flygon, and expecting it to go for a Stab Super Effective Earthquake, which would guaranteed take out Sinner, I send in Rapunzel, but the Flygon just sets up Sandstorm since Raihan loves changing weather. Once again, the answer to taking out this Flygon is Choice Scar Ice Beam from Rapunzel. This will then bait out Raihan's Turtonator, so expecting either a sunny day or a fire move, I go ahead and swap out into Sinner. However, on the switch, it ends up just throwing away the turn by going for Shell Trap. The next turn, I hit it with a Stab Choice Specs Shadow Ball, which together with the Sandstorm damage from the previous turn is enough to take out the Turtonator. Gudra's the final Pokemon before Duraludon, so expecting the water type move here, I go ahead and swap out into Zim, but the Gudra just ends up setting up the Rain Dance. I then go for a Breaking Swipe, which does above half damage to the Gudra, as it hits me with a Rain Boosted Muddy Water, which still doesn't do that much damage since I resist it, which means I can take it out the next turn with another Breaking Swipe. 
Then in comes the big bad Duraludon, and unfortunately it suffers from the same flaws as the previous time we fought it, which is that it can't hit Gemini with anything but unaffected moves. For that reason, Gemini can tank everything that this Duraludon has to throw at it, and then just retaliate with a few Iron Heads, taking it out, sealing the deal. Does it piss anyone else off that you can't call Flying Taxi from this area in the Slumbering Weald? Yet when you talk to Hop, it's no problem. Has its perks to be the champion's brother, huh? Like, I'm Unova's top model, give me a break here. Jim Challenger, you must help me. Did he lose his pants again? Never mind, he's back to wearing them. He doesn't really look like he's a fan of me making fun of his underwear earlier, though, so we are gonna have to take him on in a fight. Fortunately for me, though, we kind of have the perfect answer for his Steel-type team in Chandelure. Right away, Sinner can take out Excavalier with a quad effective Choice Specs Flamethrower along with Berserker. Kling Klang is faster and can hit us pretty hard with Assurance, but a Flamethrower is enough to take it out too, along with Barathorn after it. This leaves only Kappa Raja, but with Choice Specs, we're of course just gonna totally annihilate its entire health bar in one hit, just like- Hold up. Yeah, unfortunately Specs Chandelure wasn't quite enough to take out the Kappa Raja in the end, but we still have a few Pokemon in the box that we can replace it with for the final fight. After Sinner goes down to a Max Quake, we can easily just send in Frostlass, taking care of the rest of Kappa Raja's health, which means that we don't have to deal with this pantless clown anymore. The final stretch is now upon us, so we have to prepare to take on Leon, the first thing I did is evolve Zim into a Dragapult. My final team to try and take on Leon ended up being Rapunzel equipped with the Wise Glasses, Skeleton with the Expert Belt, mostly because I didn't have a better item for him, Monaco with the Eviolite, who's mostly just there as Death Fodder, to be honest. Then there's Shedinja, who I just now realized didn't keep Coconut's nickname. I gave it the Focus Sash, and I had a great strategy to beat Leon with it, but things kind of went a different way. Gemini the Age of Slash doesn't have any great matchups in this fight, but I gave it as good a moveset as I could. Then finally, there's Zim, whose only relevant moves are Dragon Darts and Phantom Force, since I did give her the Choice Band for some extra damage, since she's such a speed demon. And so with the preparations out of the way, it's time to take on the final challenge of the run versus Champion Leon. He always starts out the fight with an Aegis Slash of his own, so I go ahead and send in Rapunzel. Expecting either a Flash Cannon or a Shadow Ball, either of which would take me out in one hit, I go for a Protect just to bait the Aegis Slash into attack form. Now while its defenses are down, this gives me the perfect opportunity to go for a Shadow Ball, which of course takes it out in one shot. This baits out Leon's Cinderace, and obviously I can't stay in here, so I go ahead and swap out into Skeleton to tank the Pyro Ball. It doesn't end up leaving me with a burn, and the next turn I get hit really hard by an Acrobatics, and unfortunately a Scald isn't quite enough to take out the Cinderace. I don't really want to sacrifice Skeleton for no reason here, so I swap out into Zim, who can tank one Acrobatics at above half health. With the Choice Band, Dragapult's ridiculous base speed is still enough to outspeed the Cinderace, taking it out with a Dragon. Dragon Dart. Leon sends in his Haxorus, but since Zim is so much faster and we've got the Choice Band super effective Dragon Darts, it stands no chance as Leon then is forced to send in his own Dragapult. Unfortunately for him though, Zim's quicker to the draw and can fire off its Dreepies faster, taking it out with the Dragon Darts. Then in comes Seismitoad, which halts Zim's sweep. Expecting to get hit by an Earthquake or something, I go ahead and swap into Monica, who just gets toxic on the switch. After that, the Seismitoad hits me with a not very effective Earthquake, which barely does 20% of my health. I then take the time to set up a Leech Seed and figure, you know what, this thing can't hit Shedinja, so I better switch it in, forgetting entirely that Shedinja can definitely be hit by Toxic. Uh... Yeah, this is right up there among the dumbest plays of all time on the Antler Boy channel. I thought Shedinja was going to be a super useful team member this run, but it ended up flopping pretty hard. I then send in Rapunzel and click Ice Beam, hoping that it would be enough to take out this Seismitoad, but it wasn't quite enough and it just toxics me. Leon then of course goes for a full restore as another Ice Beam does about a third of its health. After Leech Seed, I hit it with an Ice Beam which takes it down into the red as Seismitoad hits me with an Earthquake, taking me down to 41 HP. However, with the Leech Seed damage, it's enough to take out the Seismitoad, leaving only Leon's Charizard. And there's not much else I can do here except just take the Max Rockfall, which is unfortunately going to knock out Frostlass, but it does waste one of Charizard's Dynamax turns. I then send in Skeleton, who's only at 37 HP, which means it's going to get absolutely destroyed by a Max Overgrowth. Finally, I decide to send in Zim, who can outspeed and go for a Phantom Force, which does mean that we can dodge the final Dynamax turn. Then after Charizard takes some Sandstorm damage, it gets returned to its normal form. This means that Zim's Phantom Force is going to hit Charizard while it doesn't have its Dynamax health, and it's not quite enough to take it out. An Air Slash from Charizard unfortunately takes out Zim, and not even the Sandstorm damage can take out the Charizard. 
However, this means we can send in the true MVP of the run, Monaco, and finish off the Charizard with a Shadow Sneak, which means that in the end, I beat a Pokemon Sword Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Ghost types. It really got down to the wire there, since Agent Slash would have likely just gotten taken out by a Fire Blast. With only two Pokemon left, Pumpkaboo really pulled its weight, and after this run, I love this guy. Shedinja was really doing work in the beginning, but it kind of fell off towards the end since every trainer's prepared for it. Anyway, let me know what run you'd want to see next in the comments down below, and until we see each other next time, have a good one. I was born to be a sinner, born to be degenerate.